Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Leadership Synergized, a location and place where we have a chance to bring to you some very special people who've experienced a great deal of success to share their wisdom in paying experience forward, in particular, on the people who've influenced them and how they have went about, including lessons learned in developing their leadership toolbox. I am so pleased today to bring to you my very good friend, Coach Patrick Brady. Coach, thank you for taking time out of your schedule, time away for your, from your family to join us today. Hey, anytime. I think this is a great thing that you started, Kevin. And I think those are things, I'm sure, that, you know, that growing up, we didn't have the technology that they have today that to be able to just Google and be able to search for things and those kind. But hey, I, I think that's the thing is with the leadership always be evolving and be able to adapt to the changes of the ways and everything. So thank you for having me on and Leadership Synergize. It's very humbling for you to have me come on here to speak. Well, coach, you're a very special individual with a lot of background. And I say coach and for those of you that may not know Patrick Grady, he's a lifelong educator, a lifelong educator as a child of educator and educators in that piece. Coach Grady, why don't you take a moment to discuss your background and how education has played throughout your life? Well, education has been, I guess you could say I went into the family business. My dad was a lifelong teacher and coach, and one of the things that he always told me was he's a teacher first. And by that meaning, he taught, whether it was in the classroom or on the court, he taught life lessons. And I could see that. I could see the effect that he had on people. I could see the effect that players that came back or they would come by the house. And that had an effect on me that, man, this is something that I would like to do. I would like to be able to have that kind of impact on people like he did. And so I decided to go into education. And luckily I went to Indiana State. It's where I met my wife, where ironically, my wife was going to be a teacher and that's what she was studying for. And her mom was a lifelong educator. So it was, it's kind of interesting. Both of us, she just finished year 30 and I finished year 29. So you could say that in our household, education has been very important for us. Now, our daughter is not going into the family business. She decided, so I think she's breaking the ranks there. But that's one of the things I th too, I think as leaderships in, in a family, you want them to be able to pursue their dreams and passions. And I think she is, we'll be starting at Belmont this fall in the sports administration getting a master's in sports administration there. So we're very proud of her. And like I said, education has been a big part of our life. And I've been fortunate. I coached basketball for 32 years. Uh, whether I get back into it, I don't know. We'll see. I'm always open to talking to people about it. But it was one of those where I just took a, decided to take a step away, at least for the moment. Whether, like I said, I don't know where, don't know that where my next venture will lead me. I've enjoyed my time as the IT coordinator with the HBCA and look forward to continuing working with the Hoosier Basketball Coaches Association. So I'm still connected to basketball, just that don't have a team to play and practice for every day. So Coach Reddy, I hear that itch exists. I know as we're recording this, it's during the Indiana High School Baseball Tournament and being a formal former baseball coach, I don't really miss the practices of the regular season games or the 25 to 30 degree weather decisions on whether you go play or not. But tournament time, right? Man, I could jump into the box and coach in a heartbeat. And I don't know that once you've coached that you ever really lose the itch to go back and do it. How about you? I don't think you do. And that was when it, when it hit me this year. You know, I've talked quite a bit and I look at you as a mentor for me, and it was the state tournament when it really got me that I got that little itch. But at the same time, right now, I'm not having to worry about playing summer basketball, <laughs> as you said, in the heat, in the gyms and driving a white bus two or three hours, and you've got 
10 kids that you're responsible for on the bus and those kind of things. But I think you always do have the itch. I think it's just something that coaching is, there's just something special about it. And I think it, it allows you to, I think, have an opportunity to even be more of a leader and be able to do, to be able to touch more lives in ways you can't do in the classroom, especially anymore in the classroom. Coach, you talked about education being in the family business. When did it first come to Patrick Grady that he was going to be an educator? He was going to be a coach. When was it obvious to you? I would say probably middle school. I could tell just athletically, I didn't have really what it was to go up and be a college player or anything like that. And so you know, I knew I wanted to coach. Then at that point, I wanted to coach in Indiana. And to be able to coach, you had to have a teacher's license. So then what would I teach? And a lot of back then, a lot of coaches were, were PE teachers. And I thought about that. And then at Terre Haute South, when I was a sophomore, I had a typing teacher, Brenda Fortson. And Mrs. Fortson, she pushed me, challenged me. And I tell you, like, I was able to be a pretty good typer and or typist, however we say that. And I'd never thought about anything like other than PE to teach. So then when I went to Indiana State, I could see that PE was pre-med. And at the time, and I was like, I was not real, real sharp in science. But I'm like, I, go, I went back to my sophomore year and Mrs. Fortson and how she was able to make typing fun for me. At the same time, she instilled discipline. And I thought, okay, well, what do I have to do to teach typing? Oh, it's business. Hey, well, I like numbers. I always liked math. I just, it was like calculus, that upper level stuff. So I thought, hey, this would be fun. Now I could teach business, teach a little bit about numbers, about starting a business, maybe. That interests me. You can kind of teach what's going on with current topics when it gets to the business end. But I really wanted to be a typing teacher. And what's funny is over my third, 29 years of teaching, I started actually teaching on a typewriter where they had to even have the page guide, put it in and type. And then two or three years later, we went to computers. And then after that, it's almost like where now they don't even have typing in the high schools. And I think they teach, like they let a computer teach kids how to type on the computer in elementary school. So then I was teaching different computer software stuff and just still wasn't, it was not, wasn't typing. But at the same time, as we said, we evolved and those kind of things. But that's really when it started, I would say my sophomore year in high school. And then when I got to college, it was though that experience that led me back to why I wanted to be a business education teacher. I love that story, coach. And I can relate from this standpoint. I think it was my sophomore year and I was taking typewriting and I never got to be what you would call a fast typist. If you recall, they measured the words per minute and then looked at your mistakes you had. And that's kind of how they graded you, whether it was on a pica or an elite. I remember having one of each in a own suitcase in that regard. But as I look back, as you stated, Within a decade, less than a decade, we had this thing called the IBM PS2 keyboard. I go back and reflect, and I honestly believe typewriting was the greatest high school K through 12 class I ever took with how things have evolved since. Absolutely. And if you think about it, and I still don't think today, even the computer, like they just look at the screen. So that now if you give them something, they've got to type something off on another thing. But at the same time, I'm sure they're, those, the kids now, they're used to using four or five screens. And now they're looking at this and typing that and listening to music and what, whatever. <laughs> it's one of those where you look back and, you, but it was a great time. And the great thing, how the story kind of ended up was I went back to Terre Haute South and taught for nine years. So I was in the same department as... Brenda Fortson. So I got to teach wow. alongside Mrs. Fortson for nine and she would got to be a mentor for me as an educator. So I owe a lot to Ms. Mrs. Brenda Fortson from Terre Haute. I love that. And 
the great thing about the computers, right? We could do away with the correction tape and keeping it aligned. And I don't know about you, but I always struggle getting the paper rolled back to the right spot so I could correct it without having to take the hand eraser. Because when you use the hand eraser, you didn't know how hard to do it and you either didn't get it corrected or it went all the way through the paper and then you got to pull the paper out and start all over. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, yes. <laughs> I struggle with all that. We're going back down a memory lane. I'm not sure we anticipated, but I love that piece. You said you didn't know where this was going, so that, that this is great. Yeah. Coach, thank you for sharing that piece. And as you look throughout your career, you say you've been 29 years, your wife 30 years, and recently we had all the COVID aspect, 2020, the late winter, early spring 2020, but there's been more and more stress and burnout of educators occurring recently, at least it appears to be, to where instructors and educators who may never anticipated they would leave the field have stepped away, many of them at much younger ages. I think that there's a lot of things that factor into this. For my wife and I, we decided that we wanted to be educators. We didn't really have a desire to be administrators. I wanted to coach. She directs a play, a school play. So that's coaching in itself when you're trying to get middle school kids to get lines. And so we, the both of us, we wanted to be able to enjoy raising our daughter and be able to go and not miss things there. And it, it is tough. I think things have changed. I think Coach Knight used to say, kids haven't changed, adults have. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. And I think there's definitely, it's not the same that from when we started. And I get it. Like we talked about keyboarding and it's not the same how it was when we first started. But I think, I think adults have been afraid to tell kids no as a parent or whatever sometimes. And I think we've sheltered kids to where, we, you know what, it's okay to fail if you learn from that. And now, did you try? Did you know? And I get that, but I think too many times it's hard to hold people accountable because it's somebody else's fault if there's a failure, except for the person in the mirror and you can run the biggest con on mom, dad, teacher, whatever, but you can't con the guy in the mirror. I think there's not enough self. I would, what I would say, just self accountability. And it used to be like, if we failed, I can remember, I wanted to prove somebody wrong. If a teacher told me they didn't think I was doing my, to my best ability, okay, well, I want to prove, I want to show you now. Okay. You've got me. And I think now it's tough. It really is. And I think you have different, I don't want to get into anything political, but now it's each student's worth 6,000 some odd dollars. So now we want to make sure we don't lose students. So when we discipline them, we've got to be very careful in those kind of things. And I think it's just, it's nobody's fault in it. It's not one person's fault. I think we have all kind of helped lead to this difficult situation. I'm not saying it's administrators fault. I mean, I don't blame them. I mean, yeah, I would be the same way when you start looking, it's kind of like when I was working in retail sales and they would tell you the customer's always right. Well, we've gotten to the point in education where the parents are always right. Why? Because why, why is the customer always right? We don't want them to go business, to do business elsewhere. So now the parents are always right because we don't want them to take Johnny or Sally elsewhere. That That's my two cents on it. I don't know. I appreciate that path, Coach. And early on when you were introducing yourself, something hit me. You were really describing what we know as intrinsic motivation. That self-awareness, but the self-pride in performing at an excellent level and not accepting subpar work, mediocrity, not accepting commitments that doesn't reach a level of performance excellence. Have we went too far in becoming a data-driven society in education, in business, that we've lost contact with that intrinsic, just laying the heart out and 
rolling up the sleeves and putting the elbow grease in and let the sweat come. And when the end result gets to where you knew it would get to, there's that degree of satisfaction just for a moment. And then you go back to work on the next project. Yeah. And you're a baseball guy. And I know you're a Cardinal guy. I'm a Reds guy. And, and there's the money ball, right? The great movie and yeah, Brad Pitt, Brad Pitt. Yeah. And so when you talk, you look at statistics, well, being a Reds fan, people are like, is Joey Votto the best player to ever play for the Reds? And I'm like, how can he be? Like, they're giving me all these stats, but there's, didn't you watch Johnny Bench? Didn't you watch Pete Rose? There's something special about those guys. They won. Not a knock on Joey himself, because you have to have eight other players. You have to have great pitching. It's a bullpen league now. I'm back in the you know, 70s, mid-70s, bullpens were not as specialized as they are now. And I don't know how the Reds would have been because they made a lot of their runs in the 6th, 7th, and 8th innings. The, would they have done that against a specialized bullpen? Righty, lefty? I don't know. But there's something about, like, I think LeBron's a great player, but I can't explain. Like, everybody tells me all these stats that he's better than Jordan, but the eyeball tells me that Jordan just won, and he did it like he maybe didn't do one or maybe he didn't shoot this percentage that you wanted or have the assist or whatever. He did what it took to win, and like I'm, I, I think we have become too data driven because what is it in education? Like I think a success to be successful is to be that person that you most want to be and then given 100% effort at what you do. And how does that measure on a standardized test? I don't know, but I can tell you when I see kids that when they can get their hands on something, they it's like a masterpiece. It's like a Picasso. But to have them get up and speak like this, they're not comfortable. You and I are comfortable doing this. I'm not sure I'd change a tire. I mean, I, I really like, I, I have trouble when it comes to those kind of tools and those kind of things. I wish I was better at it. I wish I would have taken some of those, some more of those classes in school. So I think, I do think we become too data driven. And I, I don't think we give the kids enough opportunity to find it out, like whether it's internships or whatever. I think. We're so worried about the test that it's just, I think we've, I think the pendulum, hey, I agree with you. I think the pendulum has swung so far the other way that we've taken out the eyeball test. We've taken out, just like you said, what does, I mean, and I like to, what does an A really mean? Does it mean, and when I would, when my daughter would come home, I would, I wanted to make sure I'm like, hey, what'd you learn today? Okay. Tell me a little bit about that. All right, great. What did you learn? That's what I would like to know. Like, what did you learn and how can you apply it? I think it's more important than so-called grades. Now, my daughter did very well. She was salutatorian. But at the same time, I wanted to let her know that it wasn't just about making A's. It was about what, what can you do? What can you learn? How can you apply it? I don't know how we could put that on a test, but... To me, that's what education is about. What did you learn? How can you apply it? And I don't think we allow kids to be critical thinkers enough to be able to think outside the box. How to recover from failure. What I hear you saying, Coach, is whether you end up with an A, B, C, D, F, and I am one that's a proponent that the A through F grading system is probably well past its time. To your yes. point, how do we challenge and continue to build rigor and relevance? And we have some outstanding educators and great schools in play in our country and around the world and some super students. But many times to your point, it seems like the path is established early and failure is not accepted as an opportunity to grow through. And speaking of the NBA, you give me Bird, Magic, Michael, Kareem and Bill Russell, and, and I'm fine. You, you, to me, you've got five of the greatest ever. Their stats may not cover some of the stats we see out there today. But when you consider the era, the challenges that took place to your part, 
a point a while ago, there's some eye test that needs to come into play, and that's that experience. God doesn't make us like Jesus on day one after birth. There's a maturation process throughout our life. Amen to that. Coach, we've had a great discussion on your education background and talked a little bit around where we see things and where it might go for the future. I hope you're able to stick around because I'd like to get your backdrop and your experiences from a leadership development and talk specifically about the people directly who've helped you in your career. Absolutely. Can't wait. You're enjoying Coach Patrick Rady on this episode of Leadership Synergize. We will have another episode with Coach Rady coming up. Remember, it's not about going fast. As Coach John Wooden said, be quick, but don't hurry. In a paraphrase, I call it being still. Psalm 4610 tells us to be still and know that he is God. We're going to talk more about leadership, how we can be still, yet move forward and be successful with Coach Patrick Brady. Thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful day and know I appreciate you.